Today's episode is brought to you by Dr. Jeffrey Halstead, DMD. Dr. Jeffrey Halstead has been Canandaigua's hometown dentist for more than 35 years, offering routine dental care as well as cosmetic dentistry, implants, and dentures by their highly trained and experienced staff. Visit them online at canandaiguadentistry.com or find them on Facebook and Instagram. this month it was announced that the Ovid Big M had been sold. It was a relief to local shoppers who maybe wondered what the future was of their hometown grocery store. Those are far less common than they were a few years ago. And in the post-pandemic world, it's a lot more expensive running a grocery store. But Sue Serencion, whose family has been in the grocery business her entire life, says the time is right and the Herman brothers, who will take over the grocery store, have big plans. I'm joined by Sue as well as Scott and Jake Herman. They started in the grocery business as teens at Hagedorn's Market in Webster. All three are here to talk about the decision and what's next for the Ovid Big M. Thanks to all three of you for being here. Uh, Sue, I would like to start with you. Uh, why is now the right time for selling uh, the business? For me personally, it was, uh, I really wasn't ever sure when that time was going to be. Um, I think for our family, it was a matter of finding the right people, uh, people that had our vision for a small community and keeping the store alive, working with the community. And when I met Jake and Scott last year, um, in August and just kind of heard such great things about them, um, meeting them and seeing what they've done with their stores, then it became the right time um, because they were interested. And for me personally, um, with my husband becoming the sheriff and some of the things that we're involved in, it was becoming harder and harder for me to spend as much time here. So it kind of like all of the logistics and timing kind of just worked out at the same time. I'm also curious, what were the, I'm sure there must've been an emotional side of it too. There's the pragmatic portion of when's the right time, finding the the right components and people. Um, but I would assume there was an emotional component too, since this is literally ingrained in your family. Um, to kind of walk us through what that was like as you're now going through the process of actually, you know, that transition of ownership. I don't think I've really gotten there yet, although now I'm thinking about it. So thank you. Um, (laughs) um, It is, uh, you know, I tell everyone that my father bought the store when I was a month old. So it started with me and it's kind of ending with me. Um, Although this place will always be a part of me. And she's really, she's clawing at me uh, as I am trying to leave. I've been bruised and tripped. And I mean, she's she's not letting go easily. Um, but it's it's bittersweet. And um, but I'm so proud of the um what my family has done, uh, what the community has partnered with us to do. Um and I know the community and my family are very excited about the Herman brothers taking this over and really just, you know, propelling it into the next generation with their families. And that was really important to us. Um, we made a promise to all of our customers that we were going to, when we left, it would be in good hands. And so, um, you know, we've all really prayed about it. We've met with them. My father gave his blessing, which was very important. And uh, so we're, we're feeling really good about it. And uh, Scott and Jake, they are the Herman brothers. They will be the ones inheriting uh, this gem in the center of Ovid. Uh, Guys, why did the Ovid Big M make sense um, from a business standpoint for you guys? Uh, You've already got a couple stores. So why did this make sense to be the next addition to that fleet? Jacob, you want to answer or you want me to? Oh, you can take this one. Okay. Um. We're very familiar with the local um, side of the business and supporting the local, not only the customers, but the communities. And we do a lot in the Irondequoit area that we've come up. I mean, we were born and raised in Rochester, but we ventured out into Syracuse as well now. And Big M, we've been part of Big M all the way back to my days in Hagedorns when I used to work at Hagedorns and uh, we used to buy from Big M and follow the Big M platform. And having a community store is very important to us as um, not only for their survival, because honestly, big box stores are taking over everything 
and the small stores are kind of falling by the wayside. And um, all of our stores are on the, I would say the smaller side platform. And um, we, I, I think that's our niche where we, we value not only our customers, but our employees and kind of the community aspect. And um, it's really, truly not that far from us to be, I mean, part of our, say, Herman family of the grocery stores. Yeah. Um, and to that end, it's interesting. Um, obviously, I, I, I live in Webster, so very familiar with Hagedorns. Um, yeah. And oh, they are actually, uh, you guys probably know, they're they're going to be closing their doors here uh, in the next few weeks as you guys take over uh, the Ovid Big M. I, I'm curious, you mentioned kind of big box taking over everything. Um, what are some of the challenges of, of running these community stores, these smaller footprint stores, um, when so many people are, I guess, accustomed to the big box experience? Is it something that, you know, you're able to kind of live in your own lane or are you having to kind of incorporate different uh, things that big box stores do by comparison or or what's kind of the dynamic with that? I think it's um, kind of a combination. Yeah. Of, I think it's kind of a combination of both. Um, obviously, when we have more stores and we're acquiring more stores, we have more buying power. Um, which allows us to pass that value onto the customers, which one of the things that the big box stores, they can buy in such large quantities. Um, sometimes with smaller local stores, you just, you can't compete against that. But what you got to find is you got to find your niche, find out what the community specifically needs and what they value, and then kind of target and kind of target the, the, a little bit towards the customer a little bit more in that way, specifically um, what, what the community actually needs. Um, and I think just giving what, what the community actually wants and um, just finding your niche and kind of just going about that way. Yeah. Um, Sue, I have to ask, how relieved um, was the community and is the community in South Seneca that it's not store closing, it's not doors closing forever, it's this thing is very much alive and it is going to remain in the community? Well, I can tell you, people have been talking about this since August when I think they knew that I was in conversations. You don't get, Pat, you don't get, but... Everything that goes on here, people know they're like always watching you. So when they saw two guys walking through the store, they immediately knew something was up. So um, a lot of questions, a lot of anxiety about what would what would happen um, if the same employees would be here. Um, you know, what was it going to mean? Would they would we still be not working with the community and doing all the things that we do? And so um, it's really the reason why a few weeks ago I went live on Facebook with it, it just to be very transparent to kind of relieve some of that anxiety because I know that there were a lot of there were a lot of misinformation out there and I just wanted the community to know that hey this is going to be your small town local grocery store where community serve you know where we our customer service is number one um, we're still going to carry out your groceries we're still very invested in you um, and so that that Facebook post alone relieved a lot of stress. And, you know, it's just, you know, we've got um, the Strawberry Festival weekend that's coming up and we're the Herman Brothers are kind of come down. So we're having an event where they get to meet the owners and hopefully they're going to be in the parade. And we just really want the community to meet them, embrace them, because I think they're going to be thrilled when they see what what's going to happen in the, the years to come. And, and of course, you've been super engaged in the community for as, as long as you've been at the helm here and in the business. But um, there's also the practica, practical element here, which is that if you live in Ovid or or South Seneca, um, you're pretty much like, what, 30 minutes away from a grocery store at best? Correct. Um, it's, it's interesting because the big M down there really does fill such a void. It's a huge space. Yes. Yep. Um. So future of grocery stores, this is something that I wanted to talk to all three of you about because I think it's interesting. Um, there's probably some uh, element of less is more. We're going to see fewer oh small town grocery stores, but uh, is there a maybe a bigger opportunity for some of these smaller grocery stores as they survive and as they continue forward um, to maintain their customer base and and maybe even grow it? Uh, if they're able to give a, a a better level of customer service than maybe some folks are accustomed to uh, going into, say, Walmart or some of the other big box stores where 
you know, you really don't talk to anybody while you're in there. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Um, being in an independent world since I was 15 years old, um, you basically get to know almost every person that walks in to the store. And um, it's a different level of service from corporate world where there's constantly shifting people through. I mean, I can tell you, even at Sue's establishment, all the way up through Hermas and stuff, we have had employees there for up to 40 years that are there. You know what I mean? Um, we, we have long-term employees that don't usually move around. They stay with us. They grow with us. They get to know everybody. Um, they can, they know people by name. They know what they're buying. They can walk up to the deli counter and they're like the usual. And they'll say, yep. And they'll cut them. You know what I mean? Half yeah. pound of boar's head Turkey or whatever it is. And, they 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 know everybody and i think moving forward in the future we can be more adaptive to our customers we can offer higher levels of services in perishables and um still find value for them and keep it local yeah um prices that's always something very interesting um how does a, a smaller uh, a smaller series of grocery stores um, maintain the the balance there between quality and um, keeping costs in line with what customers expect because it's really interesting. You can go to a grocery store in in a larger you know larger city. We'll call say like Geneva, uh, and folks will complain about the price of milk or whatever the case may be. And yet, uh, for as long as the Big M has been in Ovid, you rarely hear that. And it seems almost opposite of what I think most people would expect thinking about it logically. Um, how does that happen? And uh, how much work actually goes into uh, making sure that you guys are able to keep prices uh, where they are in line with what customers expect? I mean, I think we always try to keep um, mindful of prices, knowing what other stores in the big cities are offering. But I think what I have found here is that customers are you know, for they might pay 10 or 20 cents more here, but we're engaging with them. We're asking about their family. We're taking, I mean, our, our uh, grocery manager who's been here since he was a teenager, they don't even have to walk outside. He knows where their car is. He's got the groceries in and back while we're still talking about the weather. Um, and I think that sense of community and just feeling like we're all part of a team, including the customer, um, people are just, they buy into that. And uh, so they're, that they're willing to pay a little more and they understand that, you know, if we don't survive, they're going to have to drive that 30 miles uh, to the next door. And so um, it's a level of understanding and we do educate on that as much as we can. And, you know, like interviews like this, uh, it's a good time to remind people, you know, Hey, we, sometimes we can't beat the larger stores. And, and that's why this partnership is so important because with three stores, there is more buying power and, you know, and I know that's important to uh, Jake and Scott. Curious on that end. Has there ever been thinking back to the year before the pandemic through the pandemic to present day, has there ever been like a four or five year window where um, the price of goods has shifted up and down so dramatically? I mean, all Never. three of you have been in the business forever. I'm, I'm curious about that. Cause it seems like there's been a ton of volatility on that side. I've never seen where you can have eggs literally in a couple of weeks, triple in cost, sometimes up to five times what they normally are trending at. Um, honestly, it's probably one of the biggest issues that over the past year and a half has been trying to keep up with prices because the cost to us, even us, even customers will say, you know, like, well, it's gone up so much. It's like, honestly, in a given day, eggs jump weekly, but there's, the repercussions of just eggs follow in all breads, um, bakery items, donuts. I mean, it's really endless. Um, if one category goes up and how many other categories follow suit, yeah. um, you figure like ground beef or beef prices go up and all your pizzas that have pepperoni and sausage. I mean, it's just, there's a trickle down effect. And I don't think we've ever seen, at least in my lifetime, where we've seen prices jump on eggs from a dollar cost up to over five dollars for a dozen eggs literally in a matter of weeks that's incredible incredible stuff um 
Scott and Jake, when are folks going to start seeing you in the store? Maybe they have already. Uh, when? What does that part of the timeline look like? When will people start to, to see you around Ovid? So we're hopefully shooting for the week of the Strawberry Fest. Um, that's the that's the date we're shooting for. Um, things can always happen, but between Sue and us, that's that's the pinpoint date. So hopefully that week you'll start to see one or both of us around starting then. And uh, hopefully uh, that does not fluctuate. <laughs> New York yeah. State is not always... Uh, license wise is easy but it seems like we got all of our ducks in the road uh to move forward so um hopefully midweek we'll be around but sue hopefully will not go anywhere quickly um we've added extra we've hired some extra help and stuff to help alleviate that but we're hoping that sue will stay as little or as much engaged as she wants in the foreseeable future so that doesn't mean she has to be in the store every day but hopefully events or items like that with being so in community driven with her that um, she will at least be stopping in now and then at least to have a smiling face on or. So that sounds like a really nice invitation. (laughs) No, I mean, I I think it's important to stay engaged, um, you know, as much as they want me um, because uh, you know, I, my, goal is to make sure the customers um, embrace this change. Change is hard. Yeah. It's hard for the employees too. And I want to make sure they are feeling comfortable and I want us all to work together. And, uh, you know, transition is going to be hard because it's it's a big deal, but we're going to, I'm confident that we'll make it successful. And, um, and I am committed to making sure that I'm here as much as they need me to help with that transition. And you're not going anywhere. You're still going to be in the community. You're not going to disappear on us, right? um, I'm here at least, uh, let's see, three and a half, however long my husband's term is. So So (laughs) we got a couple more years for sure. Um, And last question here, um, obviously, uh, Festival Week, that'll be big for you guys. Um, Future of the grocery store, no major changes right away, probably, I'd assume, Uh, Scott and Jake? Well, I was... The yeah. great thing is that Sue has done such a great job with it. We really don't have to change much. I mean, the employees are awesome. The community is awesome. So they're, that's one of the things that intrigued us about the story, kind of drew us kind of towards it, was just how great of a job she has actually done with it. Yeah. Um, so no no major changes initially. Um, we're always going to try to find things to improve on all the time. There's always things you can improve on, obviously. Um, but she's done such a great job. There's really no major changes we need to. Plus, summer is a very busy season. So... Um, that also poses some some uh, some problems when you're trying to do some some other things when there's a lot of people in the store and stuff. But we'll if we have to do anything, we'll make it as easy as possible. But right now, yeah, there's small changes, but nothing nothing drastic because nothing really needs to be done. So yeah, that's something I learned. Uh, don't try to put new floors in on July Fourth weekend. It's not a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Speaking people from love experience, the floors, but yeah, oh yeah, they look good. Yeah. They do look good, though. <laughs> yes, they do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Scott and Jake, best of luck with everything moving forward. Uh, Sue, enjoy all this free time you're going to have. Oh, uh, I'm sure you're going to have so much free time now <laughs> oh, coming yeah. up. Uh, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All Thank right. you. Thank you. That'll do it for this edition of Finger Lakes today. If you'd like to see more conversations like this one, check out the show on your favorite podcast platform or subscribe to the FingerLakes1.com YouTube channel. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Thank mm-hmm. you.